big week for me. It's It's been absolutely incredible. You have both the NFL schedule being released and the Basketball Hall of Fame releases their class along with the ends of the NHL and NBA's regular season and the start of the playoffs for both leagues. But I'm here to talk about, of course, the Basketball Hall of Fame, the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Massachusetts, has released their class of 2021. Just one day, just one day after the ceremonies of the 2020 class, which include the likes of Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett, Tim Duncan, Rudy Tom Danovich, Kim Mulkey, Tamika Cashings, Barbara, Barbara Stevens. Um, who else? Am I, am I missing anyone? I think that's everyone. Barbara Stevens, Kim Mulkey. I, I think I have everyone. If, if there's anyone else I'm missing, please let me know. I don't have a paper right in front of me. But... Oh, yeah, Eddie Sutton as well made it last night. Uh, congr congratulations to all nine of you that in were inducted to the Basketball Hall of Fame last night. You're all Hall of Famers forever and always. But you will be joined by this year's class. It Last year's class was nine people. But this year's class, 16. 16 people made it in this year's class of the Basketball Hall of Fame. I don't know if that's the largest, but it's definitely got to be one of them. I'm impressed, but keep in mind, guys, I know there's going to be some people that say, oh, well, that's a little bit too much. Listen, you could have it like, do you want it to be like baseball and hockey this year? Base Hockey decided not to have a class at all this year because of financial issues. Baseball had the ch chance to actually induct people, but the Veterans Committee decided not to have a Zoom meeting because they thought they were too pure for that. And the writers decided to induct zero people. Not, not Schilling, not Roland, not Bonds, not Clemens, not Wagner. No one. Zilch, zero, nada. No one. Football decided to have people, but it was just the same usual eight they do every year. They've been doing every year for a while. I mean, last year they had the special 20-person class, but they went back to their boring, not boring, the regular eight-person class with the five moderns, as well as the senior, the coach, and the contributor. Just the same usual, typical class. But basketball, they know. They did something that I was happy. In the age of a pandemic, where people needed that sense of comfort and needed that sense of feeling very, very happy, they had a class that was twice the size of Canton's this year. Springfield had 16 people, double the amount, and 16, just 16 more than hockey's and baseball's combined, which means they actually had people. They had 16. And I know you're going to see some people that say, this is one too many. This is a lot of people. Well, keep in mind, the Basketball Hall of Fame, unlike with baseballs and footballs, it's just the pros. Uh, the main pros. And for football, they don't really seem to want to induct anyone that was part of professional football before 1920. Because even though they like to say that professional football was born in Canton, Ohio. No, it was born in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. The NFL was just founded in Canton, Ohio. You, that, that name is pretty misleading. But for basketball, it all counts. High school, collegiate, the pros, everything. International, Olympics. You name it, everything, everything matters. Everything matters. And I love that. I love that it shows this is the Basketball Hall of Fame. Basketball. This is the shrine of the greatest people that ever contributed to the game of basketball. And I love that. So, who exactly was put into this extraordinary class of 16 people? Obviously, they were pretty legitimate to be considered, even though it's 16 people, it's still the Hall of Fame, like it or not. And these are pretty legitimate individuals. So we start off with Val Ackerman. She was the very first ever commissioner of the WNBA with her time from 1996 to 2005. WNBA, of course, the Women's National Basketball Association, funded by the NBA. If you don't know, before, before she was even commissioner, she was a player in college, but when she was done, as well as spending a year in France, she became a lawyer. 
and then she became to be part of a special assistant to the special, uh, the NBA commissioner David Stern. But when the WNBA was founded by Stern, she became the first ever commissioner to the WNBA, which is the highest place of women's basketball in the world. And yeah, they had, there were some other leagues in the past, but the WNBA established itself as the best, and Val Ackerman was running the show for a solid decade. Decade, if I recall. It might have been a year or two off, but still. Impressive. Absolutely. And she's now currently been in one of the board of directors of USA Basketball. Commitment, ex excellence, all you can name it. Congrats to Val Ackerman for this achievement. Next up, we have Rick Adelman, who was the longtime coach of the Portland Trailblazers and the Sacramento Kings. At the very end of his coaching career, he also spent time with the Houston Rockets and the Minnesota Timberwolves. During his time with the Blazers, he went to two NBA Finals, even though he didn't make it to them. The Blazers also had a very long stretch, even after his time as a coach of 20 consecutive, I think it's like 20 consecutive M uh, playoff appearances. I understand they never won, but still making the playoffs 20 years is quite an achievement. From 83 to 2002, I think that's a stretch. I could be wrong. Please quote me. But still, for that immense, like, near like two decade stretch, always in the playoffs, you got to handle it to Adelman on that one. And also with the Kings, many people wish, and if it wasn't for, you know, the, the officiating controversy in 2002, they might have been looking at an NBA Finals. Those Kings teams in the late 90s and early 2000s were absolutely fantastic work by Adelman. And the fact that they have not made it to the playoffs since 2006 tells you a lot about Adelman's importance to that team and that organization as a whole. I am so happy for him. He also has over 1,000 coaching wins under his belt, top 10 in wins. Very, very happy for him. Congrats. I'm very, very excited to see him have his speech with his orange jacket on. Congrats, and I can't wait to see what happens next for him. Up next, we get to Chris Bosh. Of course, everyone knows him as a member of the Big Three for the Miami Heat, where they went to four straight finals and, of course, won the two in the middle. But don't forget, he was also he also played for the Toronto Raptors early in his career, selected fourth overall in that phenomenal NBA draft class of 2003 that inc included the likes of LeBron James, Carmelo Anthony, and Chris and, uh, and Dwayne Wade, of course, two of those being his teammates at Miami. I know that everyone focused on LeBron James and, you know, Dwayne Wade, but let's not forget, it was called the Big Three for a reason, and that included Chris Bosh. He was an 11-time All-Star. What other 11-time NBA, NBA All-Star at, you know, the big man position could you say or not in the hall? The only one that was left was Bosh, and he's in. And I think he should have made it last year. It's a shame that the blood clot in his legs ended his playing career, but when he played, man, he was a phenomenal player. Just because he was more quiet and he w was forced to take a step back for the success of the team, do not let that discredit you. He was a hell of a player, and I am very, very happy to see him in the hall. Even though it was one year too late, at the same time, he's in. That's what matters. That's what matters. I understand keeping him one year later because of Garnett, Brian, and Duncan. But at the same time, Bosch is in. That's what matters. That's what counts. I wish he was still, he played a few more years. But either way, he's still retired. And everyone knew he was Hall of Fame worthy. Here he is in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Shout out to him. Congrats. The next one is Bob Dingridge. For those that don't know who he is, he was a player that had four, four, four All-Star appearances and two All-NBA appearances. He was a major contributor to those teams that won the Milwaukee Bucks in 1971 as well as the Washington Bullets now of course called the Wizards in 1978 um he his number is retired by both Norfolk State as well as the Milwaukee Bucks um I was expecting Leroy Edwards here of course he was you know a, a three-time MVP for the NBL, which was the precursor to the NBA. Um, even though I am disappointed that he did not make it, I do have confidence that he will eventually, one of these years, make the Hall of Fame. Out of all these Hall of Fames, I'm the most confident that basketball will deliver and put in the people that are deserving. And Dangridge made it. Long time wait. Very congrats. Thank you so much, Dangridge, for what you've done for your contribution to the game. And you will be honored alongside your many teammates, Oscar Robertson, Wes Unsaid, Wes Unsaid um, 
And of course, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, among others, that are in the Hall of Fame. you now among them. You are now a Hall of Famer. Welcome to Springfield. Next one we have is Cotton Fist Jimmins, another guy that's a longtime coach like Adelman. He was the longtime coach of the Phoenix Suns. He is considered coach to them. Even to this day, he was also with the Atlanta Hawks, the Buffalo Braves, the Kansas City Kings, and the San Antonio Spurs. He was also the coach of the year in 1979 and 1989 and had a lifetime coaching record of 832 and 775. When he retired, he was 10th all-time in coaching wins. And even though he never made it, now one could say, why is he in the hall? Well, even though he may have never, he never went to an NBA Finals as a head coach, he still constructed some pretty quality Phoenix Suns teams. These were some Phoenix Suns teams that always made the playoffs. And even though he was not the head coach, Paul Westf Westfall was, he was a part of, you know, executive. He was still making front office decisions. And he was the one that traded for Charles Barkley. And when the Suns made it to the NBA Finals, even though they lost to the Bulls, they still made it there. It was the culmination of many years and years and years of always making the playoffs. And even though losing, always still made there, always being a competitive force to teams in the Western Conference. And handed him, congrats, congrats, Fitzsimmons, congrats, Cotton, you're, you're among the legends. The Phoenix Suns fans, the Suns fans always saw you as a legend, and now Springfield sees you as a legend. You are a legend. Congratulations, Cotton Fitzsimmons. Uh, the next one, I'm very excited for this one, because this was taken by the early African-American Pioneer Committee. I, I wish more leagues did this. Like, football has so many uh, legends from from, the, from African American legends or Asian American legends, but they don't even have any of them. I mean, Charles Fowles, the first ever professional black player, he's not in. Or Kenny Washington, the first ever NFL player after World War II to sign a contract, he's not in. Tank Younger, the first ever assistant general manager that was um, African American, he's not in. None, none of those guys are in. And for baseball, they I'm happy that they're acknowledging the Negro leagues, but. I mean, Buck O'Neill's still not in yet. There's many Negro Leagues guys still not in yet. Hockey, they finally, just finally just inducted a couple years ago. They inducted Willie O'Ree. But there needs to be more than just that. But basketball, considering it is known for being a game played primarily in the pros by African Americans and by minorities, considering it is a rather cheap sport to play, that's why they have this. And I'm very, very happy they do. And likes of Earl Earl. Earl Lloyd and you know, Nat Sweetwater Clifton and Chuck Cooper and many others. Clarence Fats Jenkins, who hopefully one day will be inducted into Cooperstown too for his time as a member in the Negro Leagues. An early African-American pioneer inductee, and he was a member of the New York Renaissance in the 19, 1925 to 1939. And he, and he won for the, I think it was the uh, African-American or the black... Um, basketball um i think it was the basketball league he the new york renaissance which the team itself is in the hall of fame as the captain of that team he won one two three four five six, eight championships you count it eight he won eight championships as the captain of that team a legendary team and he was the focal point that is incredible that is hall of fame worthy he is a legend he deserves this orange blazer. He deserves to be in Springfield. And fortunately enough, he is. I am so happy for him. I wish more leagues did something like this, but I'm happy that basketball does. Again, congratulations to Fats Jenkins. Welcome to Springfield. The next guy we have is Howard Garfinkel. Now, you guys probably don't know who this guy is, but he was the co-founder and director of Five Star Basketball Camps. That is a high school basketball camp. And he was also, he also created Basketball Illustrated. This was the very first scouting report that was widely available to, to, to scout high school basketball phenoms. Yes, he was the one that put out a magazine, put out an illustration, and showed and gave a good insight for scouts to want to see legendary names coming up in the high school ranks. You think of all these great players recently that are drafted out of high school. LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett. Partially, high school scouting, you're looking at a king right here. And he was inducted to the Co Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame in 2014. Now he's in the Hall Hall. He's in the ultimate honor. 
the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame for what he did for high schoolers all across the nation. What he did for all these scouts. Absolutely deserving. Wonderful choice. One that not the average person will know, but once you hear about it, it makes a lot of sense. Congratulations to Garfinkel. Welcome to Springfield. There's a whole page here. Don't worry. A few more to go, guys. Don't worry. We're in the meet. We're halfway done. We got our first, another WNBA contributor here. This one in the taste of Yolanda Griffin. Yolanda Griffin was an eight-time WNBA All-Star and as well as a multi-time, <clears throat> sorry, a twice-time All-WNBA first-team selection. She was also, a mem as a member of the, the now-defunct Sacramento Monarchs, she led the team to the WNBA championship in 2005. And as a representative of the United States, she took the gold for her country in 2000 and 2004. And she was also the rebounding leader twice in the WNBA as well. Very fortunate. Very, very happy for her. Welcome. You have joined your many other WNBA sisters in Springfield. And a long time her comes another WNBA legend, Lauren Jackson. The, the Aussie, the greatest Australian basketball player ever. Yeah, I didn't say men ever, period. Book it. Lauren Jackson is someone that I wanted for the Hall ever since she retired. This is an absolute basketball legend. Three-time MVP, eight-time all, um, all WNBA team member, seven-time All-Star. She led... Her home country of Australia to the 2008 World Championship. Three straight silver medals. 2000, 2004, 2008. Even though she never won gold, America is always going to be the top one. Everyone knows that. But the fact that she led Australia to it. Australia. And for the WNBA, for their top 10 team, for the first 10 years and their first 15 years, she was the only, and I think even the top 20 years, she was the only player, keep in mind, the only player not from the U.S. to represent all three of those teams, or at least two of those teams. Only one. Only one. What does that say about her? What does it say about her and her importance to the history of basketball in the country of Australia? And of course, there's way more than just that. She was, you know, twice for the Seattle Storm WNBA Championship, Defensive Player of the Year. She has all the honors, all the accolades. Absolutely deserving. No question. This is a slam dunk choice. Welcome to welcome to Springfield, Lauren. And going off the top of championships that competed and were major contributions to their home countries, Tony Kukoc. That's right. Tony Kukoc from the Chicago Bulls, hailing from Kuwait, Croatia, from the International um, Committee. Tony Kukoc, of course, everyone knows, was a part of the 3 P from 96 and 98. And it was, of course, a six-man in 96. But don't forget... He was the five-time Euroscar Player of the Year. That means for five times, he was considered the best basketball player from the entire continent of Europe. Think about that for a second. Five times, he was the best in an entire continent. An entire continent. Think about that for a second. That's how major this is. Four-time Mr. Europa Player of the Year. And... He even led Benton Travesto, the three consecutive EuroLeague championships from 1989, 1990, 1991, and representing his home country of Yugoslavia at the time. He won the gold in the 1992 World Cup, and he won the silver representing Croatia in 1992. This guy is a, yes, NBA, he's had a good career, but everywhere else, in terms of his impact to the game of Croatia, of Europe, Absolutely deserving. No question answered. This is this is a great choice. Again, I understand there may be some bold fan that might not like him, but he's he's the whole package. He's a legend. Say what you will, but he's a legend, and he deserves to be seen as a legend. Congratulations, Tony. You're a Hall of Famer. Pearl Moore, another legendary woman. She was a member. I think she was chosen from the um, Senior Women's Committee. Chosen in 2011 from the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Now, why do I say this? Well, in her time from Francis Marion College, she racked up a total of, I'm going to say this right, 
4,061 points. That is literally the most ever, the most ever, second to none in the history, the history. That is the most amount of points in the history of women's college basketball. No one else has more than Pearl Moore. No one has more than Moore. Welcome to welcome to Springfield Pearl. You're a legend. You're an icon. Absolutely deserving. Welcome to Springfield. Following up with Pearl, we have Paul. That's right. Paul Pierce, the truth for the Boston Celtics for as many, many years in the league. He is the headline of this class, one would argue. In his first year of eligibility, All-American at Kansas, drafted by the Celtics in 1998, and in 2008, winning the championship for them, as well as the finals MVP, 10-time All-Star, multi-time All-NBA. Of course, he goes in with Ray Allen, their salary before, and Kevin Garnett already there. Hopefully down the road, we get Ray John Rondo as well. And perhaps maybe down the line, we can maybe get Doc Rivers when he eventually retires. Again, he was also four-time All-NBA honoree. His number 34 was retired by both the University of Kansas and the Boston Celtics, absolutely deserving. He was the Celtics of the entire 2000s. We talk about the Celtics of the 2000s, no one can deny he was the Celtics. Just like how Bryant was the Lakers, or how Duncan was the Spurs, or how Garnett, even this time of the Celtics, was the Timberwolves, Pierce was the Celtics when it came to the 2000s. He was the Celtics. Welcome to Cooperstown. And speaking of the Celtics, we get Bill Russell. Now, you might be saying, wait, Bill Russell? I thought he was already in the Hall of Fame. And yes, you're right. Kind of. Yes, he is already in the Hall of Fame. But as a player, that's right. For those that, those that don't know, basketball does honor your entire career. But if your coaching and or playing career is so good that it warrants an entire induction in itself, you can go in the Hall of Fame twice. And this has just happened with just, you know, players and coaching careers or even contributor careers. This is also the case when it comes to if you're part of a team, like, for instance, the Dream Team, um, Michael Jordan and, you know, Larry Bird and the many others in that, in that with the exception of Christian Leitner, are already, already are in the Basketball Hall of Fame themselves, but they're also represented via the Dream Team in 1992. In this case, Bill Russell, already in many years ago for his playing days with the Celtics, winning 11 championships as a player. But let's not forget... This man is so legendary to the game that he, don't forget, he was also the very first ever head coach. That's right. He was the head coach of the Celtics, too, in his final two years of the game. He was a player coach. He both played and was also the head coach at the exact same time. That's how much Red Arbach trusted this man because he was the Celtics. When you think about the Celtics dynasty of the 50s and 60s, you cannot mention it without mentioning the greatness of Bill Russell. Of course, the finals MVP is named in his honor. And, of course, his other guys, you have Bill Sharman and you also have, um, I think, uh, Bill Wiltz, I think, is in for twice. Um, I mean, the name's off the top of my mind. Uh, John Wooden, his also time as a player. That guy for the Hawks, his name escapes me. He was also in for both his playing days and his coaching days. Absolute legend. That says a lot. When you're in, when you're inducted twice, that says way more about you. That says a lot about your greatness and your accomplishments and your legacy on the game itself. And it couldn't be done without you. Congratulations, Bill. Welcome to Springfield again. To get being inducted in the Hall of Fame twice. I mean, <laughs> that's incredible. This, this is the only one out of all the halls that do this. That tells you how impressive Bill Russell is. And there's only like a few others that have ever done this. Mm. Absolutely deserving. Congratulations. Welcome to Springfield again. Thank you. You're going to stay even longer. Your legend grows by the day, Bill. I'm happy for everything you've ever done to society. And again, football, if you're listening, basketball inducts these legends of greatness and pioneer and strength. How, why don't you do it? Seriously, why don't you do it? I mean... It's been years. And duck these guys. And I'm going to head myself. Up next, we have Big Ben Wallace. That's right, Ben Wallace from the Detroit Pistons. Four-time Defensive Player of the Year. The th three-time, I think four, three or four-time um, All-NBA. Um, 
He was honored with that throughout his time. Again, four times. The only guy to have that many is Dikibe Mutombo. And, be and Ben Wallace, besides being the focal point of that 2004 Detroit Pistons team that won the NBA Finals over the Los Angeles Lakers, he is also the very first ever undrafted NBA player to make the Hall of Fame. That is saying a lot. Because usually when it comes to basketball, it's like the top guys are, are you know selected in the draft, and then the rest of you have your role players, and undrafted is usually relegated to the G League. But this man, yes, he may not have been great on offense, but on defense, no one, no one can argue is better. Again, five years, he was named the Defensive Player of the Year four times. Ben Wallace. Absolute legend, no question. He's a Hall of Famer, and I've always known that, but he is finally retired after 2012. His numbers three is retired by the, by the Pistons. He's an advisor, I think, to their G League team, but it's much warranted. He was the Pistons of the 2000s. He was the reason why the Pistons in that era of their five, I think like six straight Eastern Conference um, finals appearances, he's the reason why they were always considered a defensive powerhouse, even without him on the court, even when he was with other teams, you know, with the Bulls and the Cavs, and I think also the Magic. He's the reason why it's known. And again, the very first undrafted player, even more impressive. Congrats, Ben Wallace. You absolutely deserve it. Second to last one here, we have Chris Weber. Of course, everyone remembers Chris Weber as a part of the um you know, the Fab Five of the University of Michigan. He knows that failed to time out for the NCAA Finals. Of course, lost in 93 and 94. You could question, no, it, it, it happened. Enough with your alternative facts, NCAA. He was the star of the NCAA. There was the Fab five, five, but he was their leader. And he's the reason why when the, when the Kings always used him in the late 90s and early 2000s, He's the reason. He's the main reason why they were always competitive. He's the main reason why they were always gutting for the playoffs. He's the main reason why they always challenged the Lakers in the early 2000s. His numbers retired, obviously. Number four. Also was the rookie of the year. Led the NBA in rebounds. Five-time All-NBA selection. Um, oh, no, I'd say that back. Five-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA second-team selection. Very, very happy for him. Many people wanted him. Many people think that he wasn't going to get inducted because of his, because the whole question involving the scandals at Michigan. But fortunately, that didn't doesn't matter. And I'm happy that that Springfield understands that. Congratulations. And finally, out of all, finally, out of all the 16 guys, this is the one that hits close to home here. Jay Wright, the current head coach of the Villanova Wildcats, is now a basketball Hall of Famer. Taking the Wildcats to three finals fours, but let's not also forget. Besides winning his two championships with Villanova, he also started for Hofstra for like seven years or so, like seven, eight years. He was a reason. He was the reason why Hofstra was always in the hunt to make the NCAA tournament. They made it several times with him, and then he got the job at Villanova. Like he's the reason why this program is still afloat today. He is the reason. He is the reason, and I'm so happy for him. Making it to those Final Fours and winning two championships. Obviously, the the eligibility for college coaches is different because they're still still um most likely to play and be a lot longer in their careers. But Jay Wright was absolutely deserving. Two NCAA Finals. He's a legend. I know he's a legend. You know he's a legend, and Springfield thinks he's a legend. That's it, Jay Wright. You welcome to Hall. You're a Hall of Famer. Welcome to Streamfield. And that is it for your 2021 W. Sorry, your 2021 Basketball Hall of Fame inductees. Once again, I'll say the names again: Val Ackerman, Rick Adelman, Chris Bosh, Bob Dingridge, Cotton Fitzsimmons, Clarence Fats Jenkins, Howard Garfinkel, Yolanda Griffith, Lauren Jackson, Tony Kukoc, Pearl Moore, Paul Pierce. Bill Russell, Ben Wallace, Chris Weber, and Jay Wright. Congratulations to all the men and women that have been in induct inducted in the 2021 Naismith Net Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame class of 2021. Again, congrats to all the 16 people inducted. This is an outstanding class. 
Cooperstown, Toronto, Canton, if you're watching, this is how you do it. Anyone upset with the large or small hall? All these men and women deserve it. If you say otherwise, please. Do you really have to wait that long? 16. Big class, very large, but I love my large classes. Especially when they're deserving is this. And I'm happy for everyone that is a member of this class. And you will be in comfortably with the several hundred, many other men and women that have made the same legendary contributions to basketball as you. And there it is, guys. That is my thoughts on the 2020 class for the Basketball Hall of Fame. Thank you, everyone, for watching. For those that haven't, subscribe to Zenny62 Media. Hit the notification bell below. Make sure to like this video and comment. We can appreciate all the ones we can get. Again, next, guys. Peace, and I'll see you again soon.